I thought I should probably start off just by trying to explain um, why the director of the Nature Lab at Rhode Island School of Design is here talking about scientific posters and communication through scientific posters. So I'll start off by telling you that I am not a graphic designer, uh, no formal training in graphic design or science communication per se. But um, as, as Sanjay mentioned, I have pretty extensive experience in informal learning environments. I spent 25 years at Mystic Aquarium working on exhibit development, exhibit design, creating learning experiences for a variety of audiences in our earlier conversation um, during the SciComm workshop. Um, I thought it was interesting because I, often we talk about communicating to the general public, let's say. Now, public means a lot of things, right, in terms of multiple audiences coming from multiple perspectives. And I think it's important to reflect on audience. I'll talk a little bit about that. And certainly in, um, in settings in which uh, we're trying to communicate science to our, our colleagues or poster design workshops or poster design uh, sessions, poster sessions rather, um, you know, there really are myriad perspectives, multiple audiences that we're trying to communicate with. And hopefully we'll talk about uh, touching on, on those kinds of, of, of topics. Really thinking, our goal today, uh, many of you are looking certainly for tips perhaps and some insights as to how to improve uh, the graphic presentation of the qualities of the scientific poster. Hopefully we'll get you thinking a little more broadly about visual communication in, in general um, and how to become more effective at uh, looking at visual information, organizing visual information. The Nature Lab, for those of you I suspect, how many of you have been there the Nature Lab? Few of you, so most of you have not. The Nature Lab is this interesting and intriguing place in our design school. It's a unique resource in our art design school, and it's a unique resource, educational resource in general. Uh, in this image, you can see the main room of the, of the Nature Lab, which has this cabinet of curiosities kind of feel to it, with thousands and thousands of specimens, perhaps 80,000 specimens now. Uh, it's been in existence since uh, 1937. And it serves as a source of inspiration for art and design students. It's a lending library of natural science specimens. Uh, students can come in and, and actually check out specimens, take them back to their, 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 their studios or dorm rooms for, for study. They can use microscopy resources for investigating them. But the, the idea is that within an art and design school setting, we have this natural science um, facility that, that really serves as a broad uh, uh, setting for multiple kinds of conversations about art, design, and science. As, as we were talking about earlier, we, we were partnering uh, with our colleagues in uh, this latest round of EPS for uh, research and, and funding. We've been hosting studios, bringing together artists, designers, and scientists to look at ways of, of exploring complex problems and exploring what artists and designers can bring to those conversations. And much of this discourse uh, has ended up in, um, uh, in, in the Nature Lab and in association with our efforts and, and programs. So uh, the Nature Lab is this intriguing place where these conversations are happening. And science communication in general has sort of found a home in the Nature Lab. And that's the genesis of, uh, of some of the work that we've been doing, not only uh, with a, a previous um, a poster design workshop that we hosted at the Nature Lab, but also in the summers working with surf students, helping them uh, with their presentation skills. So if you go online, you can find a lot of really great resources that will help give you some, some tips and insights into designing scientific posters. There are a few listed here. Betterpostersblogspot.com is really a great, uh, a great site. Uh, Maybe familiar with this, some of you. But uh, you, know, you can actually participate with the uh, host of the sites and Paul. Uh, he'll do critiques of posters. You can submit posters for sharing with, with the group. And many of the examples I'll use in my portion of the presentation uh, came, from, came from that site. Uh, ColinPrington.com is another great site. I would also encourage you, if you, those of you who are not familiar with the series of books and the website uh, that Gar Reynolds has put together, uh, under, under presentations and to, uh, to check those out. It's really insightful, not only from the standpoint of, 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 of graphic communication, but using the contemporary media tools, you know, the PowerPoint presentations, how to become more effective in the use of, of, of 
text and graphics, uh, really great insights, and I rely on that. Uh, we relied on his books quite a lot. But I do come to this uh, from the perspective of someone who crafts informal learning environments, in, in, particularly in aquarium settings. And I thought what I could share is uh, some observations on things that I've uh, learned make really great exhibits in informal learning settings. First observation I would offer is that these are informal learning uh, settings, and informal learning settings have certain types of qualities that we have to think about. Context, audience, and the fact that in these settings, and those of you who should be involved into scientific poster uh, sessions, it's, it's a dynamic environment, and just like when you go to a museum, you go to a science center, you go to an aquarium, if there's an exhibit, or an exhibition, you really only spend a few seconds, in many cases, in front of that display before moving on. Um, we know from data that in, in the aquarium settings, less than a minute, you've got hundreds of things to see. And even though you might have a really impressive display, less than a minute is the average amount of time that, the, that people will spend in front of any one particular venue, in particular presentation. So we have an aquarium setting on the left, you know, some of the qualities of informal learning spaces that they're social experiences first, right? It's a place to meet colleagues, to talk about ideas, to, sh to uh, um, share insights. It's a dynamic environment. Uh, and we have to think in those terms, in terms of um, how to be effectively capture people's attention and communicate what we want to communicate in a very effective way. The second observation is that in these settings, distance and information hierarchy, are, are, these are critical, right? Oftentimes, we think about scientific posters you know, in, in, the, in the framework of a scientific paper, right? We've got our diagrams, right? We've got our images. We cut and paste and, and assemble that into, uh, into a poster format. But really, it's a whole different mode of communicating. People approach. Uh, a poster that's hanging on the wall. And I think of it once again as an exhibit from a whole uh, series of sort of attitudes, right? You're approaching it from 10 feet away, from five feet away, from one foot away. And each, in each of those uh, situations, uh, the, the dynamics of what we're communicating, what people are perceiving changes. So in short, people look at exhibits in an aquarium setting again, both from far away, right? and up close. And what draws us in at each sort of step of the way is a little bit different. So hierarchy is really critical. This is a sort of a typical aquarium gallery, right? With a mixture of exhibits and graphics. And the graphic on the right sort of showcases what I mean. We're talking about an exhibit that has, in this case, the gra graphic has a very distinctive title, Caribbean Mangrove Swamp. So we know what this is about. You know, what's this about? That's the first question we ask. Then there's a subheading here in the graphic that says mangroves are shrubs, uh, mangroves are shrubs, trees, and other plants that grow mostly along tropical coasts where fresh water meets seawater. So if I'm just perusing this graphic, the key point is, is right there for me to take in. Right? If I don't read anything else, if I don't go into the text, I don't go into the details, I'm walking away with one key idea. I know what it's about, and I know what the core message is. I don't have to hunt for it. Right? I can just skim, and if there's 30 people in front of me, if it's set up high, I can get that information. So again, thinking in terms of hierarchy. Here's, here's a poster that was done by some uh, researchers from University of Alaska Fairbanks. It's, you know, it's a fairly, I would say, uh, typical poster, right? It's laid out neatly uh, with the data and the diagrams. But we can read, read the title, and it tells us what they were studying, but it doesn't really give me, without digging into the details of the text, exactly what their sort of hypothesis was, the question was, and what the outcome was. And yet, it's here. So if I just look at the last line of the introduction, observations suggest that larval and juvenile pollock and cod may exploit similar prey fields, presenting a potential for dietary overlap and competition. Right? 
That's what it's all about. That's what the study's about. And if I go to the summary, although these two species utilize similar life histories, both developmentally and spatially, the results indicate the potential for dietary competition is minimal. So why don't we say that? Why don't we say that more boldly with subheadings? So if I don't get to any of the other details, I can skim that poster and just walk away with the key ideas. Here's the key question, and here's the key outcome. Why isn't that included even in the title? The question of hierarchy also comes in uh, to play when we think about the use of visual imagery. This is really an intriguing uh, poster, I think, uh, you know, about, uh, you know, you can see images of red blood cells, and it's really dramatic. And from a distance, that's all I see. And you might argue that, well, that's what's drawing you in, right? That's what's going to draw me in to get in a little bit uh, uh, closer and, uh, and then read the text. Well, when I actually read the text, go into the, the text sections, I got to read it all, right? <laughs> you got to read it all. And so I really need to see those, those key ideas presented uh, boldly and clearly. So if I'm lazy and I'm looking at 150 posters, I can skim through and get the information I want or quickly see whether I want to learn more each one. The third observation I would make from my work with living exhibits that a great exhibit can communicate without words. So if I look at this, uh, again, an analogy from the aquarium world, a cichlid exhibit, what does this communicate to you? Just looking at that collection of, of fishes. Sheer diversity, sheer diversity of color, right? even within a similar body, uh, body form, essentially, it tells me this, is a, this exhibit is about diversity. It's about diversity of color, in, uh, in, in these, this groups of, group of fishes. And although this isn't a scientific poster, this is actually a student design competition, it conveys the idea that, that you can tell a story, you can tell a narrative with images alone. Right? Uh, and depending upon the audience and the setting, it may be more important to do so with, with, with images or graphics uh, than it is in text. This happens to be how energy is sort of embedded, if you will, uh, in plant material. Um, and, uh, and you can follow this along, it's pretty compelling, and you're drawn along and it tells you, you can tell that narrative without a lot of words. The fourth observation I would make is that in the aquarium world, engaging exhibits pass the fingerprint test. So what does that mean? Well, the most successful exhibits at the end of the day are the ones where you have to come through with the glass cleaner and wipe all the fingerprints and a little bit of slobber off of the glass, right? Because people are coming in and they're getting drawn into the exhibit. And they're saying, wow, what is that? And there, there's a fingerprint right there. Look at this fish. What is that? And they go through and they find something engaging and intriguing. Then they step back and say, oh, what is that species? What is, what's going on here? And so the fingerprint test is, <laughs> I would use the analogy of, you know, let's not ignore the value of a real really compelling image, right? Here, uh, modeling of flight of a bat, as it says, and you can see the graphic here, the model, visual models we created, but that beautiful biomorphic form, right? Where we were talking earlier about uh, uh, biophilic design, this uh, biophilia, this idea that we have an affinity for certain kinds of forms that are sort of emulate your body to nature, and biomorphic forms like this are, are exactly that. But that's just engaging, right? And it also tells us something about the behavior or the, what, what, they've been, what the actual uh, flight pattern is um, that, they're, that they're analyzing. The value of an image, it doesn't have to be complex, but it can just be beautiful and intriguing. It's something that we, again, have, are naturally drawn to. And here's an example from Better Posters' uh, blog spot once again, and which, you know, this is not an unusual picture that's been included of a pollinator, a bee, uh, and some flowers, but it's beautiful. It's just beautiful. I mean, it's something that, that doesn't occupy a tremendous amount of space in this, um, in this poster. Uh, it can be enhanced, and this was an example where, uh, where Zen Paul came through and reorganized some of the headings, left out some superfluous uh, information, like, you know, 
know, you see the, the logo in the upper left, taken that out, aligned the, the, the title and that image a, a little more closely, and I think it was much more effective. I should point out here to my, to, to the idea that when we tell people what our graphs are actually saying, rather than telling them what it's about, um, you can see in this, uh, in this presentation um, that they've actually summarized what, what's happened, what's happening, what's presented in the graph. So this says, you may not be able to read it, land that was only uh, minimally used has significantly higher species richness than land that was lightlier or intensively used. Okay, so I don't have to try and read the graph, right? I can, you're telling me what, you're, what it says, but you're interpreting your form. I think that's all. The last observation is, and I tell all our students that are visiting this, Successful exhibits have three things. And this goes to, sorry, our own human tendency. Color, move, movement, and interactivity. If you have an exhibit that has those three things, from a marketing standpoint, you're likely to be successful. Now, I'll leave it to Micah to talk a little bit more in a more uh, detailed way about, about use of color and role of, of color. Um, there are certain things that are just a little too intense and kind of put us off. But I think it is important to think about complementary colors and the ways in which they can draw us in. Um, but you might say, well, how do you create movement in a static two-dimensional image? Right. Well, if, here's an example where there is an implicit movement, a movement of your eye through the information. And it's done based on the way that the panels, individual panels, are laid out. And in fact, in the central panel, you can see that there are actually arrows that are drawn your eye along, it's asking you to read in a certain way. So this, you can imagine your eye transiting the, 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 uh, the, uh, the poster, you know, down, down, down in sequence. And we have to be mindful about where our eye, where we want our uh, reader's eye to go and where it actually goes. Here's another example from Better Posters blog spot. So here we have uh, a really series of really um, I think uh, they're interesting graphics, not a lot, of, a lot of text. And the authors really want us to look at the blocks this way, right? You got the problem outlined across the top and data outlined in a horizontal block across the bottom. But I would ask you to do something. Just look at the poster on the left and squint your eyes a little bit. Squint your eyes as you're staring at it. And what, in fact, do you see? You see two vertical panels, right? That's actually how you're reading it. And it has to do with how the, the, the blocks are laid out. Well, how would you solve this problem? Well, uh, he, did, he suggested that you could improve this by doing one simple thing. And that is increasing the space, right, this gap between the upper and lower blocks of text. And when you do that, now all of a sudden the upper panel reads as a single block and the lower ones as a single block. Here's another example of where I think we want to look carefully about where your eye is drawn and where the content is laid out, right? So interesting, right? Spiral, like our nautilus shell, uh, essentially, and, and I'm drawn into the center, right? And where does your eye want to go? It wants to spiral outwards. Unfortunately here, the introduction is in the upper left, the methods are here, and the results are over here. So in my, in my view, this doesn't really reinforce the way in which your eye is naturally drawn. It's an interesting and creative way of presenting information. You could argue that this, this might attract somebody's attention from afar. But here you have to look at where naturally your eye wants to go and then follow the, the content, it seems to me, in a similar way. Now let me just wrap up by saying, um, we'll talk, we're talking a lot about visual communication and organization of information on a static graph. But I'll, I'll make a prediction here that within just a few years, we're, we'll be working with other kinds of dynamic media, right? even in uh, scientific poster uh, sessions. Right? How many of you have, have worked on, let's say, try putting an iPad in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, you know, including an iPad, let's say, in your scientific poster? And I know that there are sometimes issues I've learned in conversations with colleagues that sometimes you're not allowed to use uh, electronic media in a, in a poster session, but... Uh, There's some examples of AGU this year. Are there? Of iPads. Yeah, iPads. Yeah. We, our SURF students have done that at the SURF conference. 
But what it does, of course, is it gives you the ability to, to dive in more deeply, right? You can show images from, from a field site. You can show data in, in uh, much more detail than you really have room for in a static, uh, in a static graph. But I would say that as micro touch technology improves, the screens get thinner and thinner and thinner. Uh, you'll be able to essentially present your poster as in a totally dynamic way. So somebody can come up, open up a folder, explore information, roll it, and roll it back up and, and take it back again. Likewise, we'll have the ability to um, work with augmented reality to bring other kinds of video information into a static poster. We're doing this right now. Uh, Cynthia Beth Rubin has been at, with her students uh, looking at marine plankton and working with Susanna and her team to look at new ways of representing uh, marine plankton has been doing a lot of work with uh, augmented reality. And you can check out this website, erasmus.com. The technology is pretty straightforward and, and very user friendly. So I guess the last point I would make is I think we have to challenge ourselves. I think within our, we acknowledge that within our disciplines, our posters are more than just vehicles for presenting our research. They, re they represent the identity of our labs, perhaps our departments uh, or schools, and there are elements that are often standardized that uh, sort of creates a brand identity. And it, sometimes it makes it hard to explore new ways of presenting the information in this format. But maybe we should question uh, what's the most effective way to engage our audiences? And this is a completely different style. It's a cartoon type of style. But I think it asks us to say, well, how, you know, how bold do we want to be? And uh, for, in order to improve our, our, our ability to really target our audiences clearly and effectively communicate information and do it very quickly and efficiently. So, so thank you very much. I'll turn it over to Micah.